Thanks, Minister. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul O'Hara, and uh, um, it's my first time at the McGill Summer School, so I'm just uh, a novice. I just got here last night, but very much enjoying it so far. And a big thanks to Joe um, for inviting myself and also the, the kind of Change Nation organization uh, to be here this week. So um, uh, it's also good to be back in Donegal. Um, my father is from Arnmore Island, uh, just up the road from here. And I'm from Mayo, so we used to pass through Glenties uh, several times every year on our, way, uh, on our holidays. And I was always happy when I got to Glenties because it was nearly Burton Port. So you can imagine. O occasionally, though I don't recall the Highland Hotel. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's good to be back. I guess the, the reason I've been invited here by Joe is on the back of Change Nation. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Change Nation um, was set up by a group of, uh, of young people, as we're described here at length. Um, uh, basically, I, I think a group of people that had a... a a sense of responsibility to do something about the crisis that we find ourselves in. Um, I work at an organization called Ashoka, which is the, the world's leading network of social entrepreneurs, uh, all with solutions to all manner of social problems across education, healthcare, etc. And we have the privilege to be exposed to these solutions day in, day out. So um, I had the idea of bringing 50 of the uh, world's top social innovators uh, to Ireland to start working on, on a number of the challenges that we face here across uh, education, uh, job creation, uh, environmental challenges, etc. So, um, so this happened in, in March. We brought the 50 uh, together for a few days um, and the, the purpose was really to try and cultivate uh, local demand for as many of the ideas uh, to spread across Ireland as possible. And I'll touch on, on a couple of them later on and also um, we'll have several of those innovators, uh, a number coming from overseas here on Friday. So please do return if you're departing and stay if you're tempted. Um, so um, the, the question that Joe poses, uh, where is our loyalty to and respect for our state? Um, in, in thinking about how best to deal with this question, I did what I usually do, which is change the question a little bit. Um, to how do we build loyalty to and respect for our state because these are things that can't be taken for granted and they, they're actually things that I believe are earned um, over time. So what I want to reflect on is a few things that I think we could do to cultivate uh, respect for and loyalty to the state, not least uh, Peter Mayer's thesis which was uh, there needed to be a sense of shared ownership and shared responsibility. So the, the, the first thing, um, I was in uh, Washington, D.C. last week uh, until Saturday. And on Saturday, they, uh, they celebrated the first landing on the moon 43 years previously. And this was an audacious vision outlined by John F. Kennedy that the American people would put man safely on the moon within a 10-year time horizon. And it seemed like an outrageous thing, but they delivered it. And I, I think the... the that has, uh, they, they still, it still fuels the kind of imagination and ambition of the American people, as a good vision should. And when I think about the, the, the current government's uh, priority is very understandably about job creation. And uh, the, the related vision that the Taoiseach uh, regularly articulates about making Ireland the best small country in the world to do business by 2016. Now, there's no question it's an ambitious vision, and if it was achieved, there would be significant economic and social benefit. But for me, it's not a, a vision that the majority can resonate with. You know, um, uh, building a country that's the best place to do business in is probably relevant for some policymakers, for sure, maybe the business community, but probably not a huge amount of people beyond that. So, um, you know, We've heard regularly about this decade of centenaries that we're entering, and you know, I think a significant landmark is 10 years from now, 2022. It's come up a number of times uh, over the course of the last 24 hours, um, which was the, the foundation of the free state. Um, so 10 years from now, Ireland will be 100 years um, since it uh, officially found its independence. And that 10-year time horizon gives us a, a, a great runway to do something exciting. And I think, you know, we have an opportunity to build a vision that's, um, that, that unites the people in a common purpose uh, towards something meaningful that 
that uh, helps us, uh, that, that fuels our imagination and our ambition, just like uh, putting a man on the moon did. And so just to build on the Taoiseach's vision and just to really start a conversation, this is uh, something I came up with on a, on a plane a few days ago, so it's not like the, the ultimate vision for Ireland. But the, the vision that I articulate is Ireland at 100, the best place to live on earth. And I think, um, you know, it, it, it's actually uh, uh, something that I believe is achievable uh, within, within this time frame. And I think it's something that uh, the people of Ireland will be willing to unite behind once we have a shared definition of what a great uh, country, to, what, what, what living is. Uh, and and I, I read a book recently um, called Flourishing by an academic called Martin Seligman. And he outlined the kind of growth of well-being indices as a, a, a very, um, a, an increasingly popular means of measuring a society's success. And I think we desperately need a new measurement of success um, beyond, uh, you know, the, 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 the typical uh, GDP metric, which actually was a driver of a lot of the, um, the kind of dysfunctional behavior that has us in the economic mess that we're in today. You know, particularly when you think about the weak regulation on the banks that had the domino effect, you know, that weak regulation was really driven by the need to continuously grow GDP. And I certainly don't want to live in a country that measures its success based on its GDP. I want to live in a country that measures its success based on the well-being of the population. And the, we're getting increasingly, uh, we're getting much better at measuring this. You know, these are subjective metrics. So. It's not like GDP shouldn't be, re retain its, its prominence as, as a key metric, but it should certainly not be the main one. So I think, you know, in, in thinking about this vision, the first thing we have to do is re reframe what we think of as, as success. And that will in turn reframe what we value and, and, and the values that we use in going about our daily business. Um, so I just want to give um, just a, a flavor of a couple of the ideas that we're working on that I think can... Um, can help with uh, building a flourishing society. One uh, that Joe touched on earlier, uh, and I bring it up because it has a presence here in Donegal, it's called um, Roots of Empathy. And this is an idea that, um, well, just to, to say a little bit of the backstory, I, when I, when I um, uh, uh, was applying for my first job in Unilever, I had to do a, a psychometric analysis and uh, on seeing the results of the psychometric analysis, the HR manager gave me a book called Emotional Intelligence, which I'd never heard of, but it's a book by Daniel Goleman, and she basically said, you need to work on it. So this was my, uh, this was my first introduction to emotional intelligence, and uh, I'd just finished business school. I'd never even heard of the term, and on reading the book, it was uh, very significant how important uh, it was considered amongst leaders all over the world. So that was about 10 years ago, and then a number of years later, I came across this idea in Canada um, where this lady had figured out how to cultivate social and emotional intelligence in young people, um, scientifically proven to reduce bullying, aggression, uh, violence, and increases all the pro-social behaviors like sharing, kindness, compassion. And um, so, so we invited this lady, Mary Gordon, to Ireland a couple of years ago, and we had different demonstration classes, and now it's functioning all across Ireland, um, and it's actually in 29 primary schools across Donegal, including the, the local school here in Glenties. Um, so we're, we're building a, an empathic civilization, and our goal is to ensure that every young person in Ireland masters uh, this key critical skill of empathy, which is at the foundation of so many of the challenges that we need to overcome. So that's just one of the examples. There'll be several more here um, later in the week. In terms of... Um, um, another critical ingredient to the achievement of a shared vision is, uh, is I believe, shared responsibility. Um, in building Change Nation, you know, to spread 50 ideas across the country requires thousands of change makers. And just in the few days in March, we were able to recruit thousands of change makers to, uh, to investigate and discover the, the 50 solutions that we were marketing. And many of them are now moving into uh, pilot stage. Our aim is to get 25 of them up and running within a year. And the, the, what, what I, you know, the, the fact that thousands of people were willing to get involved demonstrates for me a, a sense of responsibility, uh, a sense that people really want to be involved in rebuilding Ireland. I think that's why everybody is here today as well. And 
the, 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 I think to harness that energy um, requires a, a reorganization, a reorganization of how we work on problems um, so that we can mobilize the energy that exists across the, uh, the citizen base in the country. Um, no longer is it uh, the government's responsibility to tackle our problems. You know, it's, it's the responsibility of everybody in my view. And I think that this, uh, th there's a very positive tre trend that's driving this need uh, to be involved in rebuilding Ireland. And we see it all over the world in our work with Ashoka. And it's a, it's a quest for meaning in, in what people spend their day-to-day uh, their -day work doing. Um, it, it's, it's the quest for a sense of purpose. And the reason people want to do it is because it's very satisfying, it's challenging, it's fun. And being a change maker is a very empowering thing. And once people sample it, they'll never go back. Um, so one of our ambitions at Ashoka is to build societies where everybody can be a change maker, and that includes everybody here. So the, the key to mobilizing um, large groups of people behind a common vision is authentic leadership. And I think what we need more than anything is authentic leadership that we can trust, that we can believe in, um, that we can follow, and I think that leadership needs to come um, Right across, uh, right across the country. And the truth is that leadership doesn't come from the top down. It comes from the inside out. So it's up to everybody here to decide what kind of country they want. Um, the, the, uh, j just to reflect on uh, an idea, when I was watching, I was down in Mayo watching uh, Michael D. Higgins' uh, acceptance speech, a uh, very powerful acceptance speech the day, he, the, the, the votes were ca uh, the day, day after the votes were cast for the most recent presidential election. And during that address, he spoke about the great sense of responsibility he felt in taking the presidential pledge. And that pledge, he pledged the best of his abilities to the service and welfare of the people of Ireland. So I'll just repeat that. The best, he pledged the best of his abilities to the welfare and service of the people of Ireland. And I was reflecting on it over a pint that evening with my brother-in-law. Um, and. I, I was thinking to myself, you know, I think there's, there's probably a significant number of people in Ireland that will be willing to accept uh, such a pledge. Uh, maybe not exactly the same one, but a, but a variation on it. Uh, a pledge, um, you know, for example, uh, should we invite um, citizens to pledge to make an Ireland the best place to live on earth? And I think such a pledge reframes how we think of ourselves as citizens. Um, you know, no longer is it looking to the government saying, I've got a problem with this, I've got a problem with that. You have to uh, think of yourself as a change maker in such a society. And I think pledging the best of your ability to the cause of Ireland is one sure way to cultivate respect and loyalty to the state. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, so w one additional point in terms of building this vision, um, uh, to make Ireland the best place uh, to live on earth. We need the best people on earth working on that. And uh, the truth is, I think we can get it. You, Ireland is very uniquely placed to get it. And that, that's what we experienced with Change Nation in inviting 50 of the world's top social innovators here. Um, and they all came. Um, and those that couldn't come are coming on Friday or uh, at a later date. But the, the, the fact that they all came, I think, is a reflection of how Ireland is perceived around the world. Um, there's, there's a tremendous amount of goodwill, and I think, you know, partly it's down to our very unique hospitality um, as a people. And uh, I think we have to leverage that goodwill um, in the rebuilding of Ireland to get, you know, thinking beyond the diaspora, which is undoubtedly a tremendous resource, an underutilized resource, 70 million people beyond our 4 million people. But we actually need to think like 7 billion people. Um, because the solutions are beyond the diaspora. The talent is also uh, somewhat beyond the diaspora. And uh, if we have a vision, a vision that can be a beacon, not just for Ireland, but for all societies, I think we can most certainly attract the very top people in the world, business entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, thinkers, uh, academics, media, um, artists, etc. So, um, but, but, you know, I think... For us to do that without making Ireland a test case for the rest of the world is potentially just another version of what Peter Muir described as a moral localism. Um, and I think that's the danger a little bit of nationalism, um, is that we get too focused on the local. Um, 
without considering our impact on human beings uh, beyond our borders. So um, just, you know, to, to uh, conclude, I guess, with a challenge to everybody, the challenge is what are you going to do over the next year to change uh, this nation? What are you going to do to make sure that Ireland becomes the best place to live on earth? It's a totally achievable vision. I think it needs uh, leadership from across all sectors and leadership from within all of us here uh, to achieve it. And, you know, one of the biggest barriers to becoming a powerful change maker, I think, is the fear of failure. And, but if there was ever a time to be fearless, I think it's now. And I don't think there can be any, uh, I don't think there can be any failure in trying to make your community a better place, to be honest. So therefore, you've actually got nothing at all to fear. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>